August 29th, 2005. Hurricane Katrina pummels New Orleans with 125 mile an hour winds and torrential rain. Within hours, 80% of the city is underwater. In the storm's aftermath, death and destruction with damage estimates totaling at least $81 billion. Among the buildings battered, the landmark United States Custom House. Many wondered whether this 150-year-old architectural treasure could be restored. And if so, how long would it take? New Orleans is a resilient city that for nearly 300 years has floated on muddy land at the edge of the North American continent. Its history reflects a rich blend of people and cultures, beginning with the Choctaw Indians, who lived in the region for centuries. In 1718, the first Europeans, the French, settled on a crescent-shaped section of land along the Mississippi River. They named the site La Nouvelle Orleans, New Orleans. It served as a trading center that in 1763 came under the control of the Spanish. In November 1803, the Spanish returned New Orleans to the French ruler Napoleon. A month later, Napoleon sold the city to the United States as part of the Louisiana Purchase. During the 19th century, New Orleans grew into a prosperous American city. New Orleans was a big part that at that time, all the goods coming down from the heartland of the country came through the New Orleans area. In 1809, increasing trade led the U.S. government to build its first custom house for collecting duties on imported goods coming into the country. Within 10 years, a second custom house had replaced the first one. New Orleans, at the time that the, the current custom house was constructed, was the second largest port in the United States, second only to New York, and the fourth largest in the world. In the mid-1840s, to accommodate New Orleans' growth, Congress authorized the building of a third custom house. Many architects submitted plans. But the Treasury Department chose a design by local New Orleans architect, Alexander Thompson Wood. The selection proved controversial and foreshadowed the delays and difficulties that plagued the building's construction. Wood planned a massive four-story trapezoid-shaped structure occupying an entire city block in the Riverfront Business District. It was uh, intended to be a monumental building to reflect the importance of commerce here in the city of New Orleans, commerce of the nation. The Custom House blends two architectural styles. It has details of Greek Revival and Egyptian Revival uh, architecture. So basically you can say it is an Egyptian Revival building because of the magnitude uh, of the details. The Egyptian Revival details were, in the exterior columns for instance, unusual, giving the building a distinctive appearance. Wood's interior design called for a large rectangular shaped space on the second floor the general business room, where much of the custom service work would take place. It became known as the Great Marble Hall. Marble Hall, one of the most important Greek revival interiors in the country, is a very elaborate space and there you can really see the details at its finest. Marble Hall measures 95 by 125 feet with a height of 54 feet. Each of its 14 marble columns is 41 feet high. When construction on the Custom House began in October 1848, it was to be the largest government building in the eastern United States. But over the next 12 years, changes and disputes slowed its progress. New Orleans, February 1st, 1848. 
The commencement of the New Orleans Custom House in this city has been unavoidably delayed for much longer than they had, partially owing to the difficulty of obtaining the necessary materials. Very respectfully yours, E.T. Wood, architect. During that time, five men succeeded Wood as lead architect. By 1860, with the building only partially completed, the U.S. Customs Service and the Post Office Department had moved in. Then came a major interruption. The beginning of the, the, uh, the Civil War, um, the construction ceased on the building. The workers that were loyal to the Confederacy left to go fight in the Confederate Army. The, the, uh, the Union loyalists left and went back to join the ranks of the Union Army. In 1862, Union forces occupied New Orleans. Thomas Wharton. Architect, Diary of May 3rd, 1862. Went to the Custom House and the City Hall and found both occupied by large bodies of federal troops, to whom I had nothing to say. They used the unfinished Custom House as a military headquarters and a federal prison that reportedly housed 2,000 Confederate soldiers. After the war, Construction resumed under supervising architect of the Treasury, Alfred B. Mullet. Mullet had designed many important federal buildings, including the State, War, and Navy Building, near the White House. He revised Wood's original design, replacing the dome with a more functional skylight set into a grid that permitted natural ventilation throughout the building and bathed Marble Hall below in natural light. Topping the room's Italian marble columns are Corinthian capitals, featuring Mercury, the Roman god of commerce, and the goddess Luna, whose symbol, the crescent moon, represents New Orleans, the Crescent City. Mullet then substituted an unusual feature, a cast iron cornice, to replace the original granite entablature on the building's exterior. In 1881, after 33 years, the four-story gray granite custom house on Canal Street was completed. It was the second largest federal building east of the Mississippi. The U.S. Capitol was first, and it stood for the federal government's key role in New Orleans. The custom house was, uh, you could say, an anchoring point. Customs was one of the main tenants, but it also housed the United States Post Office and the U.S. District Courts also. But no sooner was the Custom House completed than it underwent changes. Electric lights replaced gas lamps and electric elevators were installed. The 20th century brought more alterations. In order to conceal utilities, a lot of lay-in ceilings were placed in, which provided sound deadening uh, opportunities, but it hid a lot of the architectural features and characteristics of the building. The alterations also hid the original wood floors which were covered in vinyl tile or carpeting. Change even came to Marble Hall. By the mid-1950s, office cubicles circled its perimeter, diminishing the room's grandeur. Throughout the 20th century, the Custom House served a number of governmental uses, which required additional changes to its interior. Along with the post office and federal courts, the building housed a military induction center a Treasury Department office, and headquarters for a number of federal agencies. In 1974, the Custom House was designated a National Historic Landmark, but many of the building's key features still remained hidden. In 2003, the Custom Service was transferred to the newly created Bureau of Customs and Border Protection, or CBP part of the Department of Homeland Security. Along with the transfer came a new mission. When the building was constructed, it was primarily to, to collect revenue for the United States. There was a lot, of, a lot of things going on in the history of the country at that time. It was pre-internal revenue service, and so the United States Customs Service at the time was in charge of collecting all the revenues for the country. And since 9-1-1, our focus is, is on terrorism predominantly, while at the same time collecting revenues 
ensuring legitimate travel and trade and protecting all the laws of the United States. Also in 2003, the U.S. General Services Administration, steward of the building, launched a two-year modernization and rehabilitation project. Its aim was to prepare a portion of the first floor for the Autobahn Institute's new insectarium, part of a lease agreement that would make the building accessible to the public while also generating revenue. But before the work was finished, Hurricane Katrina struck. While the building withstood the storm's fury, it did not go unscathed. I mean, obviously, you can see the roof has been breached in certain areas, the ceiling's been breached in certain areas there. It's got to be water damage and leaking through from somewhere. Unfortunately, um, due to the storm, um, the uh, drainage system in the city backed up. Um, the, at the, the roof is slightly inverted here at the Customs House, and unfortunately the roof filled up with water. There was, um, the water couldn't go into the regular um, sanitary system, drainage system, because it was full, and as a result the roof collapsed, causing um, you know, severe damage to the building. The water damage was extensive throughout all four floors and the, and the attic. It left a lot of mold, mildew. My understanding, I was not personally here, but my understanding is the mold was, it was described to me as being spiderwebbed throughout corridors and across passageways. And as a result, the building was unoccupiable uh, following the hurricane. Repairing the roof and removing the mold and mildew in the vacant building provided GSA with an opportunity. It's the first time it's been completely empty in 150 years. We're taking advantage of the opportunity to do a wholesale building modernization and bring in more energy efficient systems, both in lighting and air conditioning. The modernization began in mid-2006 as a two-phase project. The first phase will be to take the building and repair it to a point where we have an operable shell that's ready to receive tenant build-out um, activities. The second phase will be to actually design the new tenant spaces, lay them out, and to construct the spaces to fit their mission requirements. Phase one cleanup helped restore the building's original architectural character. For instance, the fourth floor corridor system of skylights and light wells. The work uncovered the long forgotten hoistway shaft used to move items up and down the building during inspection. At the same time, Electrical systems, communications, and fire protection systems were updated. Among the key spaces restored, the building's main attraction. We had the opportunity after the hurricane to do a um, very detailed conservation, restoration project in Marble Hall. We're taking the opportunity with the building being empty to bring in the, the large quantity of scaffolding that you see and literally clean all of the, uh, all the surfaces from top to bottom and do some minor touch up and repair. The repairs in Marble Hall followed established standards and guidelines for preserving historic buildings. Prior to beginning, GSA worked with the Louisiana Division of Historic Preservation to ensure that the cleaning would be done appropriately. We looked at conservation, um, cleaning of the Corinthian columns, the marble columns. Uh, we looked at any repair work that needed to be done. They basically provided plans and specs to advise us how this work would be undertaken. But adapting a 19th century building for 21st century use is not without challenges. In conventional construction, utilities go vertically up the wall and over a ceiling to an adjacent space. In this building with the high arched ceilings, that's not possible. We're trying to bury communications and power in the floors, we're trying to put it in the walls, we're trying to put it anywhere other than in the ceilings where we conceal some of the craftsmanship and the unique nature of this building. The logistics are difficult, but that's one of the challenges of restoring a treasure. With the shell of the building prepared, the second phase of the rehabilitation began, designing and constructing the space for tenants. 
GSA again consulted with the Louisiana Division of Historic Preservation about proposed changes to the building. The work that was conducted with GSA, they really went the extra mile to ensure that all work undertaken respected this historic landmark. In June 2008, the Autobahn's Insectarium opened to the public. Since then, 200,000 visitors annually experience the Custom House's 19th century grandeur. Audubon feels actually honored to be here. There were restrictions, but they really were opportunities because the building itself, if used properly, and I think we did, presents such great opportunities for visitor spaces and visitor reaction and visitor enjoyment. Along with the Insectarium, Marble Hall has found a new use as a setting for events which bring the public into one of the most important architectural interiors in the nation. August 8, 2011, nearly six years after Katrina, a ceremony in Marble Hall commemorates the return of Custom and Border Protection Agency workers to one of New Orleans' most historic sites. So this Customs House, as the mayor said, is an important part of our nation's history. It's one of the oldest and most significant federal buildings in New Orleans. More than a landmark, this Customs House remains a symbol of the resilience of this community, of this city. So Katrina Rita may have inflicted heavy damage to this building. Uh, it may have uh, torn down its stone. It may have forced its closure, but it did not in the end dampen the spirit of the people of the city, uh, the spirit of its leaders, the spirits of those who work within its four walls. Today, the U.S. Custom House in New Orleans has a renewed purpose and a new life. It stands as a monument to a city's past and a nation's progress. But it also looks forward to the future, a treasure restored.